Um, this year I'm going to take a little less granular view and um, I'm hoping to do at the 10,000 foot level as we look down on the budget. So with that, um, basically what I want to do is I want to cover three things tonight. And when I talk about budget development, we're really talking about revenues when I say that. So I want to take a look at revenues, I want to look at expenditures, and then if we have a little bit of time, I want to compare our expenditures with um, a group of districts. So we're going to look at some um, um, demographics. Okay. Um, revenue caps have been around for about 25 years. So most of the board members are very, very familiar with them. The one thing that, that you have to remember is it's a revenue limit. It says nothing about expenditures. So um, we aren't limited on what we spend. And that's how we can use some fund balance. We can accumulate it, spend it how we want. It just regulates how much revenue we can generate. Uh, and it's basically two things. It's prior year spending and student enrollment. It's that simple. You know, we can get into the formula and everything else, but I think just to remember, student enrollment and prior year expenditures. Enrollment's the biggest piece of it. So this is, a, out of Forecast 5, we're looking at our historical as well as um, future enrollment. We're using the um, enrollment projection model within Forecast 5's 5CAST. So it's similar to what we did with the Applied Population Lab study. We're looking at a five-year kind of survival. So we're looking at historically where have our kids gone once they enter the district. It looks at that and it projects it rolling forward when we enter what our four key enrollment is going to be. So that's how we're doing it. Questions? Okay, this is data that the next two slides are data that I've taken from what Bobby does for the library census. So to get the whole projection thing started, I'm looking at live births within the district boundaries. And historically, when we look at that, in the 90s, we could capture anywhere from 80, 85, in some years as high as 90% of all the births five years later showing up in kindergarten. Now, with all the choices parents have, people I think are even more mobile 25 years later, that we're seeing trends somewhere between, I would say, 70 and 75% of our district um, births five years later showing up in kindergarten. So over this 12-year period, we've got an average of about 195 births within the district, and we're seeing our 4K and kindergarten classes somewhere around 140, 145. Is that big drop in 2018 because 2018 isn't over yet? Um, we're doing it all on, I, I think it goes June 30th. So this is data from June 30th. So it would have been, I think, Bobby, if I'm not mistaken, it's July, or July 1 of 2017 to June 30th, 2018. Right. And then we get a little bit of averaging, you know, whether the kids are going in early or late. And then, you know, I don't know if you can read this, but Bobby gets it down. It's granular enough that we get it by township. And you can see when you look at that, if you look at the city of Annabelle, and I, I don't know if you can see it, they really have the biggest impact. You know, we're averaging somewhere around 130 to 120 births. This year, it's, it's 105. So the city has a big impact. The other thing that's important with enrollment is where are we going with um, open enrolled in and open enrolled out. So the number on the top would be our open enrolled in, students coming from other districts. The one on the bottom, the red line, is students leaving our district and going elsewhere. And I would, you know, we, we've often talked about being a, a destination district. I think this is an area where we really need to focus. You know, if we can. We're estimating in the budget model that we've put together tonight that we're going to have a difference between students coming in and students going out 
a net negative of 80 students. And I think that's an area where we should be looking to close the gap. You know, and who am I as a business manager suggests that, but um, that would be one area where we would be looking at. <coughs> okay, this next graph is one you've seen before. It's in the budget book. It's showing the trend of our revenue limit over time. And um, what's important about this is when you look at Fund 10 and Fund 27, so essentially how we operate the district without grants, 83% or better of our budget is being controlled by this, and you can see how it's declining over time. Well, we've lost a lot of students over time. So this is a graph where we're looking at the impact per student, the revenue limit authority per student, comparing Anago in the blue with the state in the red. So you can see there in, um, what is that? I think that's 2011-2012. Um, that would be Act 10. <coughs> and if you look at Anago, prior Act 10, we are now getting there several years later where we've got the same revenue per student after Act 10. The other thing that's important is if you look at this and you look at the title, it's including exemptions. So what are exemptions? The, within the revenue limit formula, if we don't get too technical, there's a whole harmless provision that says no district should have less money than they had in the prior year. There's like a little safety net, and they call that hold harmless. Then there's a declining enrollment provision that as we're dropping, they give us one year to make the adjustment to prepare for that loss of revenue because the students are lower. Then finally, there's an exemption now this year for or last year for a parental school choice program. So when we have taxing authority under the revenue limit for parental school choice, that is one of the exemptions that's now a part of our per pupil cost. Um, the other thing is if we would have passed an operating referendum, that would bump also bump up our limit. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we look at those with exemptions, our base revenue with no exemptions prior to the start of this year was $9,275. You heard the low revenue limit ceiling, where the governor is, is allowing over the next, I believe, four years to go to $9,400 to $9,800. That's going to drop, increase our revenue limit authority. How it's going to affect Anago is that that hold harmless provision. It will directly impact that because we're going to be able to generate more money. So our hold harmless provision is going to be less. And our revenue limit authority per pupil, although it will go up, it's not going to go up very much because of that hold harmless provision being the buffer that is already built into the model. So we're going to see a delay. Like this year, our whole harmless provision would be about $400,000. This year, it's one hundred and ninety, dollars because we're going from $92.75 to $9,400. So we're going to see a little bit of a delay. But that base revenue without any exemptions is still key. It means we're going to get more per student. And eventually, hopefully, our declining enrollment will lessen, our rate will lessen, and it should mean more money for us in the future. Questions? How does the exemption work with the parental choice? We get more money if the kid goes to these or? So, JD, I actually called DPI when I saw this chart, because when I put it together off of last year's spreadsheet, I actually had a dip for this current estimate for this year. And when I got the spreadsheet from DPI, it's pre-populated. I called them up and said, you've got something wrong in there. Well, we have 300,000 divided by the 2,300 kids, and you can see that we're, that's tipping that up from the prior year, because it's something new that we hadn't had. So it's a straight in and out. We're going to tax for it, and we're going to turn it right back over through um, it actually comes out of our last equalization fee payment that we get at the end of the year. So it's hurting us less than we thought it was going to be. 
Um, we're becoming the taxing authority. And whether that, that's hurting us or not, that's not for me to say. But it would make our tax rate look higher, correct? Correct. Okay, so within this revenue limit, we're going to have local responsibility and we're going to have state responsibility. And the state's portion of the revenue limit is called equalization aids. And all you really need to know is it's, it's really based on what they pay us or what they contribute is based on how wealthy our district is and um, how much we spent in the prior year along with the number of students that we have. So, um, and again, if you're interested in learning about equalization aids and you've heard primary, secondary, and tertiary aid, I'd be happy to go over that with you and show you exactly where we fall in the formula, but that's really a little bit outside the discussion tonight. Okay, so the first thing when we look at equalization aids, they want to know how wealthy we are. And this is a graph of our wealth, and they measure, the state measures wealth in real estate value, equalized value per member. So for every student, how much real estate do we have behind them? And the red line is the state's average, the blue line is our average. The takeaway here is if nothing else changes with declining enrollment, and even if our um, real estate stays the same, our students over time will appear to be more wealthy, which will reflect over time will mean we will get less aid. All things being equal, we appear to be more wealthy because, because we have fewer fewer students divided by the number of dollars of real estate. Tim, what a good example of all of this be? Let's compare just apple, not even apples to oranges, apples to kumquats. Us to Elko. Elko is a very property rich district because they have a lot of landowners up there, and they're on lakes, so their property values are higher than what they are here. Correct. So they're going to be considered to be a wealthier district, so they're going to get less state aid than we would on a, on a percentage basis. And that's exactly true, Mike. And what's, what's important about that is you'll hear le legislators complain, or you'll hear citizens complain, that the, the um, equalization aid formula is broken. The formula is not broken. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It divides the state's pot of money per student by how much real estate's behind those students. And it does it very well. But people don't agree that that should be a measure of a community's wealth. So what the legislature, we're going to talk about in a little bit, but what the legislature has done is under the revenue limit there was an inflationary calculator built in it. And it was called the per pupil um, adjustment. They eliminated that. They froze that in 2015, and they now are adding revenue on a per pupil categorical aid outside the revenue limit. So what it's doing is it's taking it out of the equalization aid formula, and it's giving it to all districts. So um, we receive, we're going to receive about $1.5 million in per pupil aid outside the revenue limit. And so essentially what it's doing is it's giving all schools um, a, a little piece of the state aid pie. And whether that's fair or not, that's what it's done because the legislator, legislatures, um, politically, that was in their best interest to do that. When you testified at that Blue Ribbon Commission or when you sent in your comments, what was mm -hmm. the gist of what you were hoping they'd do? Um, what, J.D., what I often hear a community saying why do our taxes go down if you continue to need more money? Why can't you just keep our taxes the same? So what I suggested to the Blue Ribbon Commission is that they looked at a model where we were building in some level to hold taxes relatively constant. You know, the argument could be made is um, we're, we're saying we're dropping taxes, and we'll get to that at the end when actually our equalized value just keeps going up and up and up. You know, so the average taxpayer is still paying their fair share or more. So I, that was my suggestion to the Blue Ribbon Commission. I haven't heard any, 
any output from the, the committee yet. Tim, what happens to property like uh, in managed forest or farmland preservation or land use assessment? Like uh, farmland gets, so, as long as you're using it for farmland, it's taxed at a different rate. Andy, we have something, and I, don't, I can't answer the details of that question. But what I see is I see where, our, like, if you look on um, our revenue, if you look at our revenue summary, and if you got to the detail where you were opening up your um, treasurer's report and you saw revenues coming in, you'd see PLT payments, and I call them PILT payments. It's payment in lieu of taxes. And I have no idea how that gets generated, but we receive payment in lieu of taxes. And, um, I think they're coming from even the municipalities, the townships that have managed forest crop in their land. And I can double check on that. Well, they can't come from the township. They don't collect any money. Um, they might get came in and look for, you know, I'm not sure. Oh, they might get it from the state and then yeah. pass it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the important thing is we have this cap, this revenue limit, and there's really two sides. And it doesn't really ma matter. I mean, we have the authority to tax to a level, and it's either going to be state aid that we're going to receive and taxes, one or the other. So if, if, if for whatever reason we spend less in the prior year, our local taxes could go up because we have the revenue limit authority to, to do it. So that's the revenue side of the equation. Um, oh, I forgot this slide. I, this has been kind of interesting looking over time. So you do see swings in what the state is paying. But we're the classic district with two-thirds. You know, we're essentially one-third local, two-thirds state. Yeah, that is very over time from um, our local taxes being as little as 28% to as high as 38% over the last 10 years. One other thing within the revenue limit, we have this prior service, and I don't want to go into detail. It's on page 27 of the budget book. There's a whole discussion about it. Essentially, it's obligations that were due to WRS. That's under the revenue limit. We've got a couple years to go. Once that has been paid off, we'll have an additional $300,000 to spend um, under the revenue limit. Okay, so with the revenues, there's really three sources of income. We've already talked about state and local, and then the other source is really um, the feds. And I think that represents over 93% of our revenues, and that's really, as a board member or even as a citizen, that's really the where our money's coming from. And again, we're looking at funds 10 and 27. So let's take a look at it. On a local level, now these are coming right out of the budget book. Um, I've blown it up a little bit. Um, you're going to look at our revenues. The only thing you need to know at the local level, we've got some student fees. We've got the um, sale of a construction house. We have local taxes of $7.5 million. Okay, at the state level, there's only four buckets of money that are coming from the state. Okay, the first one is, you'll see it, and, and the reason I bring this up is, board members, you often will see this on your monthly treasurer's report. And you're going to see a, a source where, you know, it'll say state sources. So the 205000 is transportation aid and common school library aid. Then the big one is equalization aid. And when you hear that Anago is a poverty-aided district because of our free and reduced lunch, we're getting um, $194,000 in addition to equalization aid as part of our state aid package. Okay. One near and dear to Kelly's heart is AGR. It's a half, half a million dollars. Then the other one that we're getting is this per pupil aid. And it also includes this year 160000 of round one school safety grant monies. Um, at the federal level, it's pretty simple too. We basically have three important buckets of money. And that first one is going to be um, you know, almost $250,000, and that's for Title II and IDEA set aside. Then the next one there is Title I. And then we get a little bit of 
Medicaid reimbursement for our special education where we provide services to those children. Uh, yeah. Title two is. Um, Title one is reading. Right? I'll talk more about that in my professional development team. Mm -hmm. we'll hold that, okay? Okay. Okay. Now, when we look at the, the graph, that pie chart was, was Fund 10 and Fund 27, and we often talk about special education. And when you look at special education, we're using general fund monies to support special ed. And we'll call that transit aids that we're providing to them. But within the special education budget, there's really only two big buckets of money. We got the, we've got the Fund 10 transfer, and then we get state categorical aid or handicap aid for special education, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's, it's almost a million dollars. And then, of course, we get IDEA, federal money. So there's only two buckets of money for special education. And when you look at, you've seen this one, I showed this last year. This shows um, looking at what we spend in um, Fund 20, 27, special education. And it shows our expenditures over time versus aid over time. And the takeaway here is the state has some certain amount of money and they get claims. This year, we're going to spend $3.7 million. We're estimating that we're going to spend that much money. And we're going to get aid on it about $967,000. They're going to give us a categorical aid of about 24% of our expenditures. Okay, we're in the people business. We really have, for board members especially, we have three buckets of expenses. Salary and benefits and um, purchase services. And we're going to go into a little bit of detail of what those are. But um, that represents about 93% of our budget. So when you look at it, here's, here's um, this is coming out of the budget book as well. This is a report that we have to provide to the state that shows our staffing levels. And board members that were at the meeting um, our first day back with the teachers, you know how many um, new teachers we hired. We are still in transition, so I don't have an estimate of exactly where we are for this school year. But if you look at that, our biggest categories as teachers is what it should be. So really, when you think of our budget, 76% of everything we do is going to salary and benefits. And this is how we spend our budget on all of these people. How does that compare to other districts? Is that consistent? We're, we're gonna, I'm going to have a couple slides towards the end that we're going to talk about. Okay? So this one is coming out of page um, 16 of the, of the book. And I, I don't know if you can see that very well. I'm going to point out just a couple of things. Under undifferentiated in curriculum, we've got a part-time STEAM coordinator that we've added this year. Under regular curriculum, we've added a um, math teacher at the middle school. Under the vocational area, we've added um, a full-time family and consumer ed teacher that is split between the high school and the middle school. Under Phi Ed, this year's budget, we're down one FTE in Phi Ed. Co-curriculars, we've added a little bit of money to um, help offset officials' costs, and we've added money in for transportation because our transportation costs have increased over time. Under pupil services, we've added an additional school counselor. Under school building administration, and you'll, you might get questions from the general public, that's essentially what we code Office of the Principal. There's a lot of stuff that gets coded to the Office of the Principal. Everything from field trips to copy machines to um, special projects that the uh, principals may be doing and all of their staff and um, their administrative teams. So to that end, we've added um, an assistant uh, principal at the high school. Um, so that's going to be a little bit of an increase. Under page 35 of the budget book, Jake put together a list of maintenance projects that he's completed in this past year. And um, his projects total almost, um, I think they're at $995,000.
um, within his budget area, he has $200,000 built in for site maintenance and for building repairs. In addition to that, he has um, $270,000 for remodeling. This past year, he had $600,000 built in for the HVAC project. In October, once we know where our enrollment is, our um, aides have been certified, our equalized values have been certified, I'll be coming to you to amend the bu budget. And at that particular point, I'll be prepared to recommend that we do take money out of fund balance, and I'll be prepared to present to you on where we're going to be with fund balance. So um, my intention at that point would be to look at another 600000 I believe that's the board's intention. And that's where um, I'm going to be going. Questions? Is he sketch? Just getting the last bit shine right now. <coughs> so it, it's going to take a little bit once we occupy the building with temperatures and control. It's going to be a few weeks, but um, yeah, we're, for all intents and purposes, done. So one of the things I haven't talked to the board a lot about is how expenditures happen in special education. And it's really quite surprising. Um, I don't think to, from Heidi's perspective it is, but from mine when I look at it, when you look at special ed, take a look at this. We're spending $3.3 million in 150,000 function area. And what that is, that's everything to do with um, cross-categorical speech and language, um, um, special education IDs, that is almost all personnel on special ed. And it's all getting coded, so we get 25% aid on that expenditure. We also have, um, down towards the bottom there, under the um, 250,000 business administration, the bulk of that's going to be transportation specialized transportation for those students. Okay, this one is a little complicated sheet. We have a Fund 73 trust for OPEP. And because we have a Fund 73 trust, I'm required to talk about it at the budget hearing. There are two, two um, portions in that Fund 73 trust. One is going to be a defined contribution and one is going to be a defined benefit. The defined benefit were teachers that retired with post-retirement health insurance. And that's in the first column under PMA. <coughs> PMA manages that account, and it's something that we no longer offer. So um, the defined um, contribution is managed by MidAmerica. It's in a, a fixed fund. Last year's yield was only 1.29% interest on it. Um, combined, we had a beginning balance of $1,708,652.84. Total contributions to the trust were $692,077.59. It was down $172,000 over the prior year. Total distributions in the trust monies that we paid out to teachers was $489,828.14 with an ending balance of $1,932,960.05. We're estimating by the year 2022, our contributions going to post-retirement health insurance benefits will be less than $100,000. So on that particular chart, if you look at the PM or the Mid America column, and you go down to additional contributions, and you see fifty-three thousand three hundred ninety-seven dollars, that was the cost of last year's implementation of reimbursing sick leave. Questions? Wait, say that. Which one was it? Fifty-three thousand three hundred ninety-seven dollars. Fifty-three thousand three hundred ninety-seven dollars. So we'll have a cost every year of about that much? Uh, it's going to vary, Andy. You know, and I'm hoping that that cost goes up. Because if it's going up, it means that it's having the impact of reducing our sick leave and our sub costs. Okay? Well, 
last thing I want to talk about, on page 38 in the budget book, we're talking about fund 80. And again, we're required to have a discussion about fund 80. It's something we can levy against the local, uh, your taxing authority. We get no aid on expenditure or the levy in fund 80. So it's what we use to fund the aquatic center. The operational budget of the aquatic center is typically $460,000. Within the fund 80, we levy 270 of those costs, 270,000. If you notice on the slide, we're showing expenditures of $624,525. This year, we're, we just completed plastering of the lap pool at a cost of 100000 and Jake is in the middle of an LED lighting upgrade project for about 65000 And we're also doing $20,000 worth of um, chemical equipment, sanitizing equipment upgrades. All of that money is coming out of um, the fund balance in Fund 80, which was all put in there by donations. Okay? How did the 270000 get set? Could you theoretically tax 400? I mean, I'm sure you can up that, but theoretically, is that up to us to It's totally up to the board. And what we've done over time is our membership has done a pretty good job of, you know, we've been in the business since 2004. And in the budget book, Mary talks a little bit, Mary Ponisek presents information on how we've used it, who's attending. Um, each month, um, we include um, a little budget report on where we're at with um, admissions, that kind of thing. And it's been very, very consistent what it costs to operate that. And we've gotten pretty good with the equipment upgrades, whether it's the HVAC equipment just a couple years ago. Now with the LED lighting, we've been able to hold costs there, and we've been able to hold the levy so we don't have to raise it. Can you see a day where that has to happen, or is that? Um, I, when we don't, if we ever don't receive the donations, we have a very generous community. And in particular, we have um, donors that really like the pool. And um, they've been giving literally hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. And when that stops, as Jake will attest, the pool is an incredibly high maintenance building. You know, chlorine and water just are, are tough on stuff. Okay, let's do a little shifting gears. If anybody doesn't have any questions on that community service one. Okay, get the signal. Okay, this is, and I don't know if you can see this, but this is, um, I'm looking at demographics. And what's important with this group, um, Andy's been pretty vocal about comparing us to other people, at least to me. And I took the schools Andy um, looked at, and I want, want you to look at their enrollment. And Mer uh, Merrill is the one with the big, um, which is much higher enrollment. That's really their charter school that's being shown there, so they're kind of an anomaly. But what I wanted to point out with is if you can see these dots, the green dots, that's free and reduced lunch. So when you look at that group, Anigo's dot, you know, we're, we're hovering right around 23 and a half to 2,400 students in this graph, and our dot is right at 50, 51 percent. So when you look at four schools within that group, we'll go to the next one. And this is going to get to Danielle's question. Direct costs. So if we look at the four schools in that group, we've got Marinette, Hayward Community, Ashland, and Anigo all have very similar free and reduced lunch rates. And our enrollments are similar. And what this graph is showing is this is showing what these districts, what this group of districts spend on direct instruction. So this is all the 100,000 areas. And the average for the group is 51.3%. And as you can see, the little red line is the average. Anigo spends below it. And what I thought was interesting, three of those four schools spend below it. And I don't have charts in here about how these schools perform, but coincidentally, the four schools that are spending above the average have the highest test scores, have the uh, highest report cards out of that group. And so my takeaway is, as we build the budget in the future, 
we got to look at direct instruction as an area that we have to emphasize because it's I think it can you know obviously if we're spending in the classroom closest to kids we're going to have the biggest impact on student achievement. Okay, this next one is looking at um, student ratios. And again, I mean, when you start looking at schools like Rice Lake and um, I think the other one is Wapaka, you look at their free and reduced. You know, they're, they're 15 to 20 points more than we are. You know, so that's completely different school. But those schools are really achieving and they have similar budgets, similar expenditures, but they're just spending it on different areas. And this is one where I'm showing student-teacher ratio. And if you look at that, out of this group, the average is 14.3 students for every teacher. Anago is at 15.2. How does Merrill get so high? Are their classes really that high, or is that something that That's all from that charter schools getting dumped in there. So it's not a real problem. Correct. And I'm not picking on support but services. Just to say that we have the highest number. Yes, out of the group. We have the highest number. And then this last one is looking at um, support services. And I just, again though, this is Fund 10 and Fund 27 expenditures. And if you look at um, the average is somewhere around 35% going to everything in, um, that's going to be principals, transportation, utilities, all that kinds of stuff. We're spending 39%. So we're spending more on the operation side of the business and support side of business than those high achieving schools are in this particular group. And what I'd like to impress upon the board is we have the tools to look at whatever schools you want to look at. Just let me know if you've got demographics that you'd like to, to look closer at it, I'd be happy to do it. Theoretically, like after consolidation, that number should come down. Because we won't have as many custodians or... Knowing that we only have so much revenue behind every child. But as we build future budgets, it's certainly something we need to think about. Okay, so what does it all mean? So what I've got there is a six-year history of uh, where we're going with the tax levy, where we've been. The column in orange is what our tax levy was last year. The first column to the right of the orange is what we're estimating this year. And a couple of key things. We don't know what's having, happening with private school choice, parental choice. I'm estimating 2.5% increase in equalization value. So that means you know, we're, we're dividing our um, revenue limit authority by much greater property value. When I talk to the Department of Revenue, we're going to see the city of Anago is probably going to take the biggest jump. And my 2.5 based on July 1 information is a little bit conservative, so we should see that tweak just a little is more. Every, is every year 2% above? Last year we used 1. So why? We're more it's positive this year? Equalized value is all based off of, um, it's essentially the, the burden the school puts on the local municipality. So it's the, the accumulated value of the real estate. In the Department of Revenue, it's all driven off this past year's home sales relative to the assessment. So there's lots of home sales in the value for them? If the value relative to the assessment went up, the equalized value goes up. If the value goes down relative to the assessment, it's probably going to go down. Questions on that? So all funds, I didn't get a chance to talk to food service. Food service is, um, we've got that outlined. They had a very good year last year. Um, but all funds, later in the, in the board meeting, I'll be asking you to adopt the budget of $31,214,511. And that concludes my presentation, Michael.
Thank you everyone for being here this evening. We will call the regular monthly, August monthly meeting of the Board of Education. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone. Love you. Roll call please. Me. Here. Andy Marion. Yeah. Mel Deep. Here. Mary Newfeld. Here. Danny Payet. Here. Danielle Yushka. Here. Katie Schrader. Here. Jeannie Long. Here. And Mike Boldick. Here. Places with bright, your faces. All right, uh, first thing on the consent agenda, we'd be looking for a motion, please. Don't everybody fight up with it. <laughs> <laughs> I need the board approve the minutes of the July 14, 2018 meeting, financial report for July 2018, consideration of current bill checks number 9045-9121. In the amount of $126,075.90, ACH numbers 18190065 to 18190071, in the amount of $871,679.48, and one wire transfer in the amount of $32,325.24, for a total of $1,030,080.62. Second. Okay, motion by Dr. Deep, second by Mr. Clyde. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Um, on to item three, citizens delegations. Anybody sign in, Tim? Okay. <clears throat> and we don't have any student representatives this month because we don't have any students right now. But we will pretty soon. So, on to new business. Uh, item A, uh, approval of the fiscal year 2019 budget. I move the board approve the budget as presented at tonight's budget hearing with a total of expenditures in all funds of dollars Second. Okay, motion from Ms. Mead, second from Ms. Log. Any discussion on the budget as presented? Once again, Tim, very nice job of explaining it. As good a detail as you did. Thank you. So, any question on the budget? Green and Bobby, let's do roll call vote on this. Candy Mary? Yes. Mel D? Yes. Mary Newfeld? Yes. Danny Pyatt? Yes. Danielle Yerska? Yes. Katie Schrader? Yes. Jeannie Long? Yes. Jessica Mead? Yes. And Mike Boldy? Yes. We have a working document for this year. Good deal. All right. Item B, Committee of the Whole. I move the board approve the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting on August 7th, 2018. Second. Motion from Mrs. Long, second from Ms. Yuska. Any discussion on that? Has Mattoon responded yet? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Do we need them until the 30th? This week, Friday, close of business for intent. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, LEA ESSA planning update. Kelly, that must be you. It is. Wonderful. So I did some handouts for you, which I know you love. <laughs> so the first one, if you could just take one and pass it down, is the or with the one that we'll go over first. And then the second one is kind of a summary. Okay. 
So if you turn your attention to the first one, it's called the um, ESSA LEA Roadmap, and what that stands for is Every Student Succeeds Act, um, and then LEA is just your local education agency. So basically what this is, is the lovely email that I received last year in March saying, here's a new requirement that we would like you to do. Um, and so if you look at it, it's about 19 pages of explicit criteria that the, the GPI and the federal government were indicating that we needed in our plan. So I printed this out for you not so that you had to read the whole thing, but just so you know what the specifics are. What I'll read you through tonight is just basically an overview of what we're doing. And it fits really well in with tonight because Tim did his budget report. And really what this is is a new requirement from the federal government saying that we need to submit a plan to the state in order to determine what is our next five to six years going to look like to meet the state's goal of reducing the achievement gap by half for each subgroup, meaning all of your different demographics and groups of students um, within the next six years. So this is a very brief overview. Um, and basically what they wanted to look at is how do we use what we are existing improvement and funding streams, how do we work all of those funding streams together in an action plan to work together for the same goals to increase outcomes. So part of what Tim talked about is all those different pots of money. So what we had to do as a team is really establish what, how are we using all of those different funding streams in order to support the same initiatives that research shows are high impact to increase student achievement. So if you take a look at this kind of um, image, it really shows a very brief overview of the different types of funding. Um, and really what the state is looking for is how are we going to use those together to create equity for all students, no matter what their needs are, so that we can provide the best um, education for all of them. So it's really presenting a, an opportunity of equity for all kids. And really what the state is focusing on is they want local districts to support, to submit a plan that um, really answers these four questions. So the first question that they want you to look at is how will you provide every student access to a well-rounded education that meets their learning needs in an appropriate, healthy, and safe environment? The second goal that they would like you to have an action plan for is how will you provide professional growth and improvement opportunities for all teachers, principals, and other school leaders to further high quality education for all students? The third goal is how will the district use evidence-based interventions and support services to ensure every student graduates from high school prepared for their college and career plans? And then the fourth objective that we're looking at is how will we make progress on closing achievement gap for all subgroups in English language arts, math, and so and math, so all students meet challenging academic standards. So, when you look at the next page, it shows basically a summary of a 30,000 foot view. So, we needed to, as a district, look at what is our current reality of all of our data. So, what is it showing us are our needs. And really, when we um, looked at all of that data, it was showing that our students in the area, when you compare students with dis disabilities versus students without disabilities, English language learners versus students that are not English language, or that are English proficient, um, in all of your different subgroup areas with race and ethnicity, our gap is very large. And in some subgroups, our gap is actually widening. And really what we're focused on and what our data is showing is how are we going to improve our universal instruction, meaning our very first layer of instruction that all students should be, should be getting. The next steps are if those students aren't reaching their goals at that level, then what interventions are we going to put in place at the next level of support and then our highest need area. So what our data is showing us is really in that look at tier three that really should be a very small, minute, percentage of your district, ours is much larger. So our, our triangle, so to speak, is upside down. So we really need to strengthen our universal piece 
for all students before we can start to focus on intervening our way out of a universal instruction um, issue. So that's what we found from our, from our data analysis. And then the next step was really consulting with all of our stakeholders. So this isn't just an administrative plan. This is really how does our entire district work together? All the different um, strengths that every single person on our team, all the way from its custodians, instructional assistants, all the way up to our district administrator. How are we all going to use what we're currently doing to work collectively to meet the needs of our students? So, what we did was we assembled a nimble team, um, mostly it was comprised of our administrative team and then we really reached out to our different teams and committees of teachers um, and parent groups and different community members that are all working towards the same goals. And then we consulted and developed our plan together. And basically what this is, is the initiatives that we already, are have, that we already have in place that we're currently working on will be strengthened over the next six years to five years and will that is the plan that we submitted to the state. So if you look at this visual, it basically shows an overview of just the four, um, the four objectives <coughs> that the state would like you to develop an action plan for. And then again, this is very brief. Like you, you saw the 19 pages of very explicit um, criteria that the state needs us to answer. Um, but this is just a very general overview of the things that we have in place over the next six years that really we just started last year um, that, that we're saying these are high impact strategies that are going to close again. So the first is answering question one, what is your well-rounded education plan that meets the needs um, and provides an appropriate healthy and safe environment for all? So this is all of the work that we're doing with our outside consultants coming in and our professional development plan working on our high quality ELA curriculum and instruction pieces. So all of those purchases that we made for curricular resources and all the work that we're doing with our outside consultants to implement our reader service workshop, um, disciplinary literacy at the secondary, um, looking at what type of instructional delivery models that we're doing with gradual release of responsibility and those types of things. No, those are, that's a lot of educational jargon, but those are the instructional practices that we're really putting all of our money behind um, in alignment with whatever those grants guidelines are. And then the, that's the academic side. And then the behavioral side is really our positive behavioral interventions and supports. So um, among all the social emotional learning and um, behavioral health, um, professional development that we're doing, those are the two big areas that we are putting all of our money into to support our students on the behavioral and mental health side as well as the academic side because we know without both of those, they aren't going to see success as they could. The next section is question two. So what are we going to do with our funds to provide professional growth not only to our teachers but also to our principals and our school leaders? So that is looking at, as Tim mentioned, very dear to my heart is the achievement gap reduction. Um, looking at all of those local grants and federal grants and really developing a detailed action plan around the same pieces. So I will come back to you many times throughout the year and show you exactly what our detailed plan is for our AGR um, money because it's a lot of money and you need to make sure that you have detailed goals and detailed ways to measure what you're doing is actually going to produce the student achievement that you're looking for. So that's really what that first block is, is looking at the professional development plan that we do have in place for our literacy instruction, our behavioral strategies, our mental health, um, everything that Heidi is doing with her trauma, or I should say here, but our trauma team, all the things that, were, that she put into place with Dr. Hartwig, um, looking at, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Connie, she's one of our instructional consultants that comes in and really works a lot with all of our teachers, regular and special ed, around behavioral and mental health. Um, so all of those details are very explicitly laid out in this, in this plan that we submitted to DPI. I didn't put all of those details in here, but those are the things that you hear during all of your board meetings that are often in this plan. Um, another area that we really focused a lot on is our mentor program. So this is a year where we're beginning to look at what does our mentor program look like and how are we going to ensure that 
that is very high quality within the next several years to make sure that our new staff, when they're on board, and know exactly what initiatives we have and are trained thoroughly to be able to carry those out. So our third goal that we are looking at is our evidence-based interventions and support. So we are getting together teams. Heidi is really um, leading the behavioral side, so we're looking at all the level of tiers um, with what supports we're going to put into place for the students who need more than just the universal, and then again, once they do have tier two interventions, what do they need, if they need more, what is that going to look like? So you hear a lot about the behavior pathway that her and her teams are working on, um, and that's really explicitly laid out in this plan as well as one of the things that we worked a lot on this summer was an, a group of teachers from all stakeholders from 4K all the way up to 12 were really looking at what are our layers of support for the academic side as well. Something we haven't had was criteria to determine what the needs are at every level and what those expectations are. So I can bring all of that to you if you're very excited. I can present more. Um, looking at our youth apprenticeship and our co-op training, so all the work that secondary is doing with all of our ACP, which is our academic and career planning, all those things, when we got together as an admin team, our, our teacher leaders and teacher groups and administrators are working on amazing things. So really what this plan is, is just taking everything that they're all doing and putting it all together to ensure that it meets the needs that we have. Another big component of this piece was our STEAM education that we are planning on implementing. So that's going to be very critical, and it was very explicitly laid out in this plan as well that that is an area that we are implementing at elementary and middle school, as well as our fab lab and enhancing that at the high school. So our last area is the, how are we going to make progress on closing the achievement gap for all of our subgroups? So one of these is, how are we going to do that with English language arts and math? How are we going to ensure they're all meeting the standards? So one of our big rocks, so to speak, is our professional development. We put a lot of money into professional development, and we are really seeing a lot of growth with our staff confidence and teacher leaders coming out of that, as well as ensuring that they're supported in learning all of these new things. Um, one of the things we're also looking at is our regular data analysis and creating multi-year action plans for how are we actually going to use the data that we have to really drive what we're doing in the classroom and at the district level. Another really large area that you hear more about this year and you've heard a little about with my AGR plan last year was the work that we're doing with our English language, um, our English learners. That was one of the areas that was really concerning when we looked at our data was that the gap was actually widening. So we have a very extensive action plan for how we're going to change that and ensure that that gap closes. The last two areas is really looking at our universal instruction as indicated by our data is one of the areas that we need cur common curriculum resources and common instructional practices to really boost our student achievement at the, from the bottom up. And then as well as our family engagement. So one of the things that um, Heather has done an amazing job with is really heading up our PTO and our community groups. And they, when this was presented to them, um, they were very excited to hear all of the things that the district is doing. So we're really looking at um, vamp revamping how we engage with the community and how we get parents and families involved and how we communicate two ways instead of just talking at them. How do they become part of the process of working with us to develop plans? So, on the last page, we had a meeting um, at CISA 9 from BPI on August 10th, and it said that we had Wendy, who is the head of the Title I presenting to us, and she did a um, presentation showing that out of, so every district had to submit a plan, and before their federal funding was released to them, it had to be submitted. So she said that as of August 1st, only 30 were approved out of 390 plans, so that's only 8% and Annie was one of them. So, yeah. So, kudos to every single person on our team, you included at the school board, you've made many decisions that were very difficult and um, it just shows that we're really on the right track because I really could not believe that we were, it was just amazing. So really it is a, a collaborative effort and it's just 
promising that we're doing the right work. So, that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Look our, forward to the outcomes. Our yeah. fancy forecast five thing that we started trying to yes. do. Someday we're going to do our monitoring reports with that. From yes. Does yeah, the data go in okay? So we're still working on building dashboards. We have a lot of data in. But Julie, our Dr. Sprague, myself, Tim, we all met with Jason just recently and looked at some more ideas for different dashboards, looking at really kind of expanding it on more of what it even was. So we're looking at looking at a multitude of different ways that we can measure what our district is doing, not only from the student outcomes piece, but also from the implementation piece. And then looking at how do we align that to our college and career readiness and redefining ready standards. So it's work. It's a work in progress, but it will be. We will be using it. Gee, what exciting. we're we're trying to do is um, communicate via Infinite Campus is the student information system, and we're using five labs to do the data analytics. And we have to automate that process so that we're not spending life to get that data in. It was a lot of manual entry, and we, we know that that's not sustainable. So mm -hmm. we've got to build the interface to automate it. Are you complaining that they got to type all that extra stuff in? Yeah, they weren't the ones typing it comes out of it. Yeah. Oh. yeah, they weren't the ones typing it in. Yeah. But what, we, what our goal is is for teachers also to be able to use and see data easier. That's one of the things that we're hearing is, we, there's data in so many different places that they can't easily use it, and we know that we need to make their lives easier um, instead of harder. So that's one of our goals. And one of the things that Jason said to us was, I believe we met with him maybe a week and a half ago, and he said that they had a meeting with the, the CEO of Infinite Campus coming up later that week to look at how do they automatically pull it from there. So that would be a huge piece if they can get that. And he said that was promising. So I have a meeting with him scheduled next week be able to look at how do we continue on that path. So I can continue to give you guys updates, but we'll definitely be using it. Good deal. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. All right. Uh, item D's. Collusion and restraint report. Heidi. The fun stuff. You should have a report attached. Um, so if you have any questions <coughs> about it. Um, the trend from last year is that they um, have gone up, but that's because we were not, I, as I explained last year, we were not reporting them correctly, um, or not at all, or defining what it meant. And so we've been working on the last year to make sure that people know what a seclusion restraint is and what the law is regarding how we have to document that and to prevent it. Um, and so with all of the work that we're doing in our behavioral health and our nonviolent crisis intervention, and, and all of that, hopefully, I would say we'll probably see another year where it's higher. Um, if you notice, West only had four, and I know that's underreported, and so we will probably see more, um, but then we should see it go down. I mean, that's the whole goal, is that we'll have less and less seclusion and restraint, because um, it's not good for kids. So basically, Pleasant View and Spring Valley had none, no occurrences at all? Yeah, they don't, they, um, yeah, that, I would say that's accurate. Now, one thing that we are training staff on, though, is that um, if you prevent a student from going where they want to go, you're restraining them. Yeah. So it's about the documentation and teaching them what we what you should and shouldn't do when you're putting your hands on. It, it, it should be used in very, very danger to self or danger to others, and I mean immediate danger. And so training them on other ways to de-escalate and be proactive. But I would say that's probably accurate. Did they probably have a couple where they dragged a kid from recess by their hand inside and the kids maybe, but I, I, I don't question that. It's very valid and pleasant view. And at the high school, middle school level, most of the time the kids, they just, okay, go. They're not going to restrain a high schooler. I mean, if anything, they'll call the police and have them be involved necessary. How do the children that aren't involved, um, how does this affect them? Like the, when the majority of the students, like what do we, I don't know, I just think of 
things Lillian came home and said last year and how it was bothering to her and like how, how do we protect those kids too you know like emotionally from some of these things that are going on I don't know how does anybody understand what I'm saying I would say that that's a really loaded question Danielle and I feel like um, the work that we're doing with Dr. Hartwig and the work that we're doing to um, to reduce and to to reduce incidences of escalation is where our staff we need to train them to you know we know better so we do better and how we create communities in our classrooms this should be a last resort mm -hmm. period and if, if a child needs to be restrained because of that generally there's things that have been done or should have been done prior to that like removing the classroom before you even get to that. yeah I mean I'm just telling you the honest truth that that's um, you know, then you talk about it, and you talk about it with the child. I mean, it's very traumatic for me when I've had to restrain kids. Mm -hmm. It's it's traumatic for that child. This is not, it's, it's not something I take lightly, and it's not something that staff should take lightly, and we have to do better at that prevention piece and that understanding piece. So I can't, I can't say that it hasn't been effective, but then people need to talk with kids about it mm -hmm. and about how they feel about it and how you prevent that in the future. What's the technical definition of support? I mean, Seclusion so would be if you are preventing a student from um, being with their peers. So we have seclusion rooms. Um, Not if you just say go sit outside the door no. for five minutes or something. And if they go willingly, no. But I wouldn't say that that's the best, that's not a good strategy to sit a kid out in the hallway, but that's another story. But um, it's, <laughs> not, uh, it's, not a, um, it's not secluded. I mean, if you prevented them com from coming back in, then you would be secluding them from their peers. But just the act of saying, go sit out in the hallway in the naughty chair. Now, I disagree with that, but doesn't is not a seclusion. So. Like, you know, I guess, like, um, with our uh, counselors and stuff, are there, I mean, I'm assuming, like, in counseling, they probably, do they have conversations about these kind of things to help, like, understand all the different personalities and how to, just in general, for kids? That's, well, and that's part of what we want to implement with morning meeting and um, our community just creating culture of community with our students um, and also with our counseling the reason that we added a counselor was because we have needs and not just this isn't just the second tier and third tier this is how do we you know we're going to have counseling sessions weekly not every other week and we're going to have counselors in two buildings versus three buildings and trying to be proactive and preventative and to be able to have conversations and if Lillian came to them and said you know that really bothered me and maybe it bothers Lillian because she didn't like to see her friend be hurt not even just, you know what I mean, like that's, I, I mean, I'm not saying that that happened, but, mm -hmm. you know, how how they have those discussions, I mean, we should have a, I mean, I've been in situations where I've seen um, kids walk in and they're put in a, the naughty chair and every kid knows that it's the naughty chair. That's that happens, right. that happened here. And that's what can't happen. And so it's just, when we know better, we do better. And we just have to keep doing that. Um, so... Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Um, HR consulting. That is me. So when I interviewed with you, and if you were looking closely at my face, that. you do remember, <laughs> um, one of you indicated that um, HR person had resigned and had not been replaced and I felt my heart kind of leap into my throat but you know I was new so what I've come to understand is that Melanie Ryan our HR specialist has tremendous capacity I am highly encouraged about where we are headed with human resources but she is not fully trained, so having capacity is not the same thing as firing on all cylinders. So um, I am not in the position, nor do I think it's necessary that I approach you about replacing Tina Verhagen's position. I don't think we need to. Um, instead, I think we've come up with a wonderful compromise, and that is I happen to know a very solid human resources director who's newly retired from the Wausau School District. So I've worked with him for almost 20 years. And um, 
you know, he is very willing and interested to mentor Melanie and help her improve that capacity. Right now she's a department of one, and I am highly uncomfortable with that because while we all chip in, it's just too much for somebody who is not fully trained. So what I would like to suggest, and you see the draft there of the employment um, provisions for Mr. Jeff Bress, and I would like to suggest that we um, have a motion and you approve this, knowing that we would not exceed that $25,000 limit um, yearly. And he is so, in my opinion, um, he's just so experienced and so well versed in the work that we need to have done that all of us collectively could mentor Melanie and it wouldn't be nearly as cost effective as having Jeff on board. So what is your uh, goal or plan for Melanie when you said that she's not at the spot that you want her to be at? Does she have to have some extra training or is it just hands-on training or does she need Correct. a certain yes. degree or uh, a certain two, number of training hours? There are two certifications that Jeff spoke of and Melanie is aware and their acronyms escape me right now. Um, so I'm looking to see if my counterpart remembers that There, one. I was looking at, Je in the letter, Jeff's got a couple of different acronyms behind his name. Okay. And one of them is... Um, uh, certified Professional Human Resource Specialist or something. Mm -hmm. It's a professional designation that he holds. And uh, he's recommending that once um, Melanie finishes her degree, she pursue that certification. And he um, can lead her toward understanding the components of what it would take to become certified. And how far is she from this degree and then thinking of the certification? That I can't answer. I'm not <coughs> certain. But I do know, you know, I watch what she accomplishes on any given day, and she really is only checking in on very significant issues. The day-to-day -day thing she has covered, which I find remarkable. For right, but the problem is that if we are looking at, if that's a requirement for the job that she have a certain degree, and then the certification, then what time frame are we looking at? And, uh, you know, will this gentleman be available for that same two, three, four years until mm -hmm. Melanie gets to that point? Mm -hmm. Or or will it come to a point where a year later he says, you know, I'm done, I'm heading down south, and then <laughs> where does that leave us? You know, can Melanie with that experience uh, be considered uh, able to take care of that situation? Or, right. or then does she have to get, wait until she gets the degree? I think she'll become closer to that optimal level, whether she has the certification or not. Right now she's acting alone. But I, I think he will expedite that process where we hopefully have Melanie in a place where she can effectively. And, and we do not need that as a requirement that she have that certification. Or We're doing it right that. now without and that you know, I was a, that was a decision made before I arrived. Right. No, no, I'm just trying to figure out. You know, do we need somebody to who's certified or uh, has a degree to to hold that position or not? And if so, what's our time frame and plan for her eventually? You would suspect that it'd be even hard to hire someone full time right. that right. would be as good as this person. Right. right. So, yeah, but completely. Well, if I remember correctly, and Tim, you can weigh in on this as well. Mr. Grass used to work for the district. Correct. He did. Well, when I saw this, I like did a little dance in my head because he's very good. Mm -hmm. And it was a loss when he left. So I was really excited to see this. Good. He's been actually a mentor to me in human resources related issues. Um, you know, in, when I was building leader, obviously he was district wide, but I just know how effective he can be and um, really help us get HR systems in place too. Um, it's a little disjointed right now and we would like it to become cohesive with his guidance. Yeah, he can, he can bring some structuring I think to it that from his experience and um, to your point 
Well, I don't think he's probably planning on going out of the area too soon because if I remember right, his wife is still working for the Wausau School District. Correct. So, she find him. Yeah, she'll come back for And he's local. Yeah. Yes, he's from there. And he, I must tell you, not that it, I want it to affect your decision, but, um, you know, Tim and I were, he, he was very humbled, and yeah. what he said to us is he's not looking to supplement his retirement. What he's looking for is to help this district and his hometown. And I, I think he's a little worried about me. <laughs> he wants, he wants um, me be to be successful, and he was just really excited to give back to a community and have somebody of his caliber at that price. Uh, I was doing a dance. Yeah. Well. On that note, I make a motion that we approve <coughs> the yes. employment for Jeff Ress. Second. Second. Okay, a motion for Mr. Mary, second for Mrs. Long. Thank you. Any additional discussion? I just one question. Do we have anybody in the district that is capable or able to take on the HR position that we already have? I mean, I don't know anybody in the state. Not that I am aware of. No other Bob, qualified. Is that your degree or no? Um, my degree is actually in marketing, but my experience is in HR. Yes. Heidi, sorry. No, Melanie is, we need to grow her. She is amazing. She is sharp. And she's had to take on a lot that doesn't even have to do with HR, and she she's just so efficient and effective. We she's work, you know, whatever we can do to support her to move her. I, I worked closely with her all summer, and she asked me questions that I you know she it's it's beyond just the this level. She's worth what you're going to be able to provide her with, with Mr. Grass. So the investment of Mr. Grass will pay us benefits. I be, I believe so, knowing what Melanie has produced. Just working with her this summer, please. Any other questions? Bobby, let's do roll call vote, please. Noel Deep? Yes. Mary Nuvo? Yes. Danny Pyatt? Yes. Danielle Yushka? Yes. JD Schrader? Yes. Jeannie Long? Yes. Jessica Mead? Yes. Andy Mary? Yes. And Mike Folding? Yes. Thank you, everyone. Alrighty, let us keep this little train moving along here. Uh, three to six, board action. Item A, all district administrative guidelines, reading number one. So we have a for motion to approve these for first reading. No, I think we just have to put before the board that this is the first reading and the second reading is what we should read. So everyone needs to, when they have time, there's a nice option, uh, take time to go through the administrative guidelines if you have any questions or comments. And it's, you always have to remember that this is a dynamic document that approving it as is gets started. You can always go back in and make changes and update as necessary. We have Neola on our side working with us, so if you see something that is of a concern to you and you want to see changed or more personalized to the district, please advise administration and we'll uh, get it back. So, alrighty. Item B, 2018-2019 academic standards. Kelly, you're up to bat one more time. All right. So you will find the... Notice of Academic Standards. So this is basically an annual um, notice that has to happen every year, um, the first board meeting of July. So in looking back, it hasn't been done since 2016, so we're starting fresh. But um, So all of the district student academic standards that we have currently in place are on here for your approval, and what we'll be doing this upcoming year is really developing a regular cycle of renewal for and curriculum design um, so that each area and content um, is updated as it should be with a team of teachers in an organized fashion. So really it's just an annual item that should appear on your agendas every year. 
I move the board adopt the 2018-19 academic standards as presented. Second. Kelly, did we adopt, what is it, CSM map in the high school the same year we adopted Common Core? Because that was around for like 20 years, right, before Common Core, but I don't know what. So um, the department, the Wisconsin Department of Instruction adopted the Common Core standards in about 2014-15. So I would imagine that would have been about the same year that we adopted it. That you did CBM. I'm not positive on that. I know it's when you adopted my math at the elementary level. Um, but one of the things that we'll be doing is working closely to really look at all of those areas to determine whether, you know, we, we don't have a, a curricular renewal process right now that's been done um, regularly. So we need to develop that and really look closely at all the content areas, including 4K. Um, all the way up to all the areas in secondary. You just still hear people complaining about that math program. I thought I Googled it once and it got invented in like the 1980s, but I didn't know what CPM, one in yeah. high school where the teachers themselves or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know the exact year that that was. I think realistically, JD, if I remember correctly, Common Core came in probably 15, 15, and I think CPM came in 16. Right, so but I think if it existed in California, we oh, it probably did. and we yeah. adopted it. That's what I mean. Yep. It's just mm -hmm. been around. Like it wasn't like built after. No. no. So this that you're adopting right now isn't saying that you're adopting curricular resources of CPM or my math or Lucy Calkins or whatever. This is just saying that the district is adhering to the state standards. So those are just resources that our district uses to reach the standards. And what we're going to really do is develop a process to ensure that those are the best resources that align with best practice as we move forward. But one of the things that we have to do is make sure that our district is using those resources to reach the standards that are adopted by the state. So you're not saying you're adopting CPM tonight. You're saying we're adopting the state standards for math and for ELA. Could we adopt the Minnesota standards if we wanted to? Or is that not I don't look into that. I'm just curious. <laughs> I don't think the legislature would like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Minnesota's got really good. Yeah. 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 Minnesota's are common core too. I'd recommend the DPI that they look at the Minnesota standards. Yeah. So, alrighty. Uh, we do have a motion on the table about the adoption of the academic standards. Any other questions on that? Hearing that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item C, the employee handbook. Let's have a motion first. I move the board approve the 2018 19 employee handbook. I'll second. Very good, thank you. Motion from Dr. Deep, second from Ms. Long. Alrighty. Now let's have some discussion. It, uh, changes. Changes are for the substitute arrangements in the sick leave bank and teacher supervision and evaluation. Other than that, it's still intact from the previous year. Districts will receive a classroom walkthrough in the non summary years of the cycle. Is that what that means? Mm -hmm. um, so, we wouldn't want, if I'm evaluating a math teacher, for example, I wouldn't want to wait for three years to be in there when it's summer year. You really want to have documentation and a, a full picture of a three year cycle. Okay, I guess I just was confused on the definition of summary year. Mm -hmm. So that summary year means the two years before the official evaluation? Correct. So it's, you know, cyclical and you, uh, you prepare, prepare. Mm 
Mm -hmm. The other two years, they just walk through. Mm -hmm. Walk through smile observation. Away. Smile away. Smile away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on that for as far as the changes? Or any questions on the handbook in general? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Item D, health and motion contract. So we contract for our, our physical therapy services for our students with special education. Have we always had a contract with this entity or was it with the uh, it was, hospital? It was the pre it was whoever was previous to Health in Motion. Prior to that, I'm not sure. It was they um, I know that Tim person took over Health in Motion. I don't remember what it was. Um, it was total Andigo, physical Andigo, therapy. No, Andigo total rehab. Yeah, yeah, that's so we that was my first year but then it changed. So it's been the same entity, they just oh, bought them out. When I read that I was a little concerned if we are sort of going that route in place of uh, <coughs> the hospital's physical therapy and then will those people be available at our sporting events or not. So that was my concern. Do we and, and I'm not really sure, do we do we contract with the hospital did you say for the sporting events? Uh, yeah. yeah, the athletic directors are uh, trainer. Tra trainer. Yeah, like trainers are. Is that something that we should look to do bids on in the future? Is for our physical therapy? I mean, the one that we have right now, she's phenomenal. I wouldn't want to not have her as long as she's with that. Is company. it still Brenda? Yeah. At one point, she worked, we had a physical therapist employed in yeah. the district, and Brenda was it. And that was, and when she, I think it was when she chose to leave the district oh. that they didn't. Didn't replace you. She didn't get replaced. Yeah. Well, they're, hard, they're hard to find. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why I think we ended up with wherever she went. Yeah. And we just don't have the needs to have a full time. And she she was very good. So we contract yeah. um, for those hours. But. Yeah. I think in 2009, the person came from like Rhineland or Oasa. Oh, they, I mean, they. Yeah. they and we tried to co-op, and, yeah. and it was it was hard for meetings and a lot of it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. So. Any other questions on the contract? Can I make a motion to open the contract? Second. Okay, we have a motion from Dr. Deep, second from Ms. Neufeld to approve the contract with uh, Health and Motion of Wisconsin. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item E, Family Corner Resource Center Agreement. All right, I believe that's me. Okay, so you have this can you have this attached in your board docs. So what you'll see on there is this is one of those things that I get a call on you know, last week and said, are you planning on renewing with us? Our contract was up to the 30th. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was make sure that I reached out to DPI um, and to our 4K team to look at why are we contracting these services out? What are the components that we need to be um, compliant with what we have to provide for DPI and for our students? Um, so we wanted to put it on the board for you to have a possible action on, but one of the things before we go through with signing this contract, I really want to look at exactly what these pieces all are. And talking to the consultant that we've previously worked for, she is new into that position and didn't have detailed um, explanation of what those services were that last was, year. That was my question because yeah. none of this makes sense to me as to Yes. What exactly are we approving? What services will they provide? Yeah. I think I need a lot more before. I agree. I think this needs to be tabled and brought back with uh, yeah. more details. I agree. Um, and so in talking to the DPI consultant that I worked with, I, I've i taught 4K in my past experience, and we've never contracted out um, family outreach. It's always been something that we did as teachers and as um, 
you know, working with our families. So one of the things that I'd like to do is really, tomorrow I have a meeting planned with our 4K team to look at what is the, what are they currently already doing? Because they may be doing all of these things already that we don't need to be contracting out. And she's never really heard of a district contracting these services out either. So um, I think we have a really phenomenal 4K team. And these things do not, according to DPI, need to be done outside of the school day. They can be things that are done with our families during the school day. It's just purposeful activities and looking at how do we document, um, how do we document alignment with how we're engaging our 4K families specifically. So really, it's not anything new or additional. So I agree. I didn't want to and move forward. I didn't forward. understand why a hospital would be providing yeah. teaching to 4K yes. students and their parents. You know, we used to have a family resource center. Yep. And that was the UW, wasn't it? I don't know who it was it's, through, it was, but it was in the first floor of the old vocational was, school. I think it was still through this. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, what's her, um, what's her Deb, name? Deb Gallenberg. Deb Gallenberg was yes. the Person. I and you go pick up the baskets of books and mm -hmm. I participated in that prior to school and then I have participated in this with 4K and it is really nice mm -hmm. you know we talked about you know healthy choices we made pizza with different vegetables we mm -hmm. made I remember made stepping stones and just having those different interactions and conversations but they were very poorly attended yeah I mean they and they the date, weren't they during the day? Right though? after school. They right would be at like 3.15. It'd be right at 3.15 and or whatever for until like 4-ish. And I mean, we did swimming. There's a lot of cool stuff that they did. But that's a lot of money yeah. for, for the amount of attendance mm -hmm. and yes. what I experienced. Yes. And when you look at the really the intent of parent outreach, it's really to build relationships with the school, build relationships with those families that this is their first experience with school, and um, really build relationships with the teachers and the students. So, in looking, there is a lot of different options for what parent <coughs> outreach can look like and what DPI expects. And so, when I meet with those 4K teachers, I know that they're doing an extensive amount of things. I mean, when you look on here, like take home activities. I know our teachers are doing amazing things with that already, and planning parent um, parent activities. So once I meet with them, then I can communicate with you further as far as what we want to look at. But I agree, we need to make sure that we really look at just because we've always done something doesn't necessarily mean that we should always just continue. And you know, you look at sorry, um, like it was really nice having the interaction with the teacher too, and with this, and that kind of organized it, but. Maybe you do something from 8 until 8.30 in the morning when you're dropping off your kids yes. and the parent can go into work a little bit later or whatever. Because really the core, it's 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 really about being with the students and the parents and the teacher. Yeah. And not being with the same three or four people that attend. Yeah. Yep. And those are all different options. And really what, the, what DPI is looking for is meeting the needs of our parents, not necessarily just doing the same things because that's what you always did. So... It could change year to year based on what the needs of your, your teachers have and what their parents, what their needs are. And looking at folding a lot of it into the social emotional work that Heidi's really leading up, all that stuff fits in. So we're doing a lot of work already that um, I, I think that we could meet this one. Yeah. I get the consensus opinion of everybody on the board here is that this is not the time to bring this forward to the board that we need to do a little more research on it. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Dr. Deep's suggestion yeah. that we put this one on the table and bring it back next month with right. more research on it. Or and bring it back only if you actually want it to do right. it. Right. And consulting with Dr. Sprague also, you know, we are both new in this position, so we didn't necessarily just want to not bring it to the board and then it's something that you always have done but we wanted to keep you informed as to it's okay you don't have to feel bad about it this no, is something we're looking at and we had this discussion yeah yep. okay so let's bring her back next month you're, mm -hmm. whenever you're ready with it, more details okay? okay very good Alrighty, then we will go on to the math langley county boys and girls club agreement for 2018-2019 Second. Okay, motion for Dr. Deep, second for Ms. Yuska. 
Uh, let's have some discussion. What do you think, people? Yeah, well, we Amy, discussed it. Amy discussed it or gave us a, Amy said that. a great yeah. job. We, we, we talk, hi. We <laughs> <laughs> talked about this so far at the committee and the whole meeting about the repairing with the after school program instead of us um, taking on a two hour commitment with our staff and then also organizing activities, snacks, activities. Um, there was a lot of prep related to those additional things. And really trying to encourage our students to be a part of the Boys and Girls Club because then they can be participating in other activities and great field trips in the summer and different things. So Angel, who heads up the Boys and Girls Club, is offering these students a reduced rate to be a member um, to, and uh, be able to participate in those other things too. So um, they're going to take on some of that organization, the transportation of the students. The, so it's a win-win for us. We are, will house the students for one hour for an academic power hour, and then the students will then make a choice at 4.30, are they going to walk with two Boys and girl, Girls Club um, staff members who will be at the middle school, are they going to walk and then maybe leave at 5.30 with their bus transportation, or are they going to get picked up at 4.30 at the middle school? Mm -hmm. So just a slight adjustment. So do you have any students enrolled in it as of now? Or, uh... Not right now, but we don't usually start until a couple weeks in. And we also run a before school program that starts at 7 in the morning because some students get dropped off, and that's run primarily by Bonnie Knight for us. And so once school kind of starts, that's when kids kind of start to realize, hey, I'd like to do that because my friend's doing that. And <laughs> yeah. It keeps them out of trouble. Yeah. yeah. So the before school program begins a couple weeks into the year, too? Yeah, it'll probably start a little bit sooner than the after school program. Okay. But Questions. <laughs> so, any other questions? Uh, this one concerns a little bit of money, Bobby. Let's do roll call vote, please. Mary Newco? Yes. Danny Payet? Yes. Danielle Yushka? Yes. JD Schrader? Yes. Jeannie Long? Yes. Andy Mary? Yes. Jessica Mead? Yes. And Mike Boldy? Yes. Me too. <laughs> we totally do that. All righty, very good. Thank you, everyone. Now we are on to item G, the medical advisor agreement for 2018-2019. Motion to accept. Second. But now I have to discuss it. And that's why we're going to do that. We have a motion from Dr. D, second from Mr. Pyatt. Um, Medical advisor agreement. Discussion? Yes. Um, and I think we have our principles here too. Um, my question is that when you look at the prescriptions will be written for epinephrine and the glucagon, I understand that. Why are we not talking about Narcan with the opioid overdose? No, I think Dar Darlene did just bring that up this year, that at the mm -hmm. high school and the middle school, we're going to stop that now. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to have that in the year. Oh, is it not in the language? It's she did say at our first aid training this year that that will be at the middle school and high school. Oh. Those, those should be, and um, I think I'd like to recommend that we have um, a one-hour sort of session for, uh, and I, I did talk to Darlene uh, so that I, if she was here, I didn't want to blindside her, but I did talk to her and told her that I'll bring this up. Um, I asked her who will be trained in the NARC, and nowadays, you know, it's not like the EpiPen that you have to give a shot. This is, you know, twist it off and you just uh, spray it in the nose. Um, some of the things that we are not quite aware of is, you know, some of the newer, the carfentanil and things like that, which are quite toxic and can even be absorbed through the skin if you reach over and, and you're trying to get some help for the for the person who's affected, you as the Good Samaritan unfortunately can uh, be toxic, can develop the toxic exposure. So I would like our uh, school district to strongly consider having a session not just for the administrative staff uh, or the staff in the office who Darlene was thinking about. I think having a session for all your teachers, all your staff members might be a good idea to consider. You can uh, talk to the um, sheriff's office and the uh, emergency room at the hospital. They do have some of these sessions where 
they'll come and they'll just tell you what are the signs to look for and you know uh, how do you just use the Narcan and you know explore the counter. This is something that um, she said, for example, she said, well, in the middle school, we're going to train the two principals. What if the two principals are not there there at the office, at the central office and something happens? And in a situation where it could be life and death if you're wasting the 10, 15 minutes trying to find the two or three people in a school who are trained and if it's their day or not, they're not there. Yeah. If you could have a session sometime in the next couple of months um, with our emergency responders and uh, ER physician and uh, the sheriff's office, I think it's a uh, dead lock. Um, they, they do a good uh, show of coming over there, talk about this common drugs of abuse, the things to look for. You know, if you see something like this in a student, what do you do in this situation and how easy it is uh, to use Narcan? Uh, I think you need to have that stocked in your schools also. Jay, I got something. Yeah, I, I think that that's an uh, excellent thing that we probably all, all overlooked. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I think that a good uh, platform to start that and really roll that out in a quick and efficient manner would be to bring that back to our lead group, which consists of as far as hospital, law, both law enforcement, uh, emergency medical, all the school districts in our, our county and uh, the emergency response teams in our county. So I think that that's a great thing. So we have a meeting next week on that. So okay. I'll throw that on the agenda and we'll see if we can mm -hmm. expedite that. Thank you. If you accidentally, let's say it's not opioid, is, does Narcan hurt somebody? It's like let, maybe they mistakenly give it to them because they think they're having it and it's, it has nothing to do with opioids. Does it have an effect? Narcan should not. Okay. Well, and that's good to know because sometimes people get into a situation where they're like, I don't want to make the wrong choice because it could, you know, whatever. So that's good to know that even if you make it Well, it's the same thing if you're, if you're thinking that they have low blood sugar. Yeah. You know, if you give them glucagon and uh, yeah. under and unless they are in a, a coma that is caused by uh, significant yeah. elevated blood sugar, I don't think it's going to hurt to okay. have a little higher sugar for an hour or two. Yeah, that's good for people to know that. No, question for you. So, for the Narcan, is that, you said, I thought you it's, said it's, it's, it's over the counter? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, according to state law, it's... Um, okay, get okay. It. the reason I asked the question is, is because looking at this, it does specifically indicate that prescription will be written but, annually. But for us to have that have in, 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 in the premises, you need a prescription from your physician. Oh, okay, now I understand. In the school district, you. because if, you, if you used it on a student and their parent or somebody questioned, so gotcha. just to call it yours up to you. Thank you. I wasn't clear in it, but I appreciate you. Thanks, Brock. You took him and I touched you. Carfentanil, yeah. What? I have no idea what that is. Carfentanil. It's a, the fentanyl is uh, uh, the medication, you know, the patches uh, for the pain or uh, you give it IV. Uh, or sometimes you use the fentanyl uh, for sedation. Carfentanil is several times more potent and it actually is being shipped in the mail. From China and elsewhere. Yeah. It's, it's very potent, and that's the reason. Um, usually, when you try to reverse the effect of opioid medications, one dose of Narcan is usually enough. And in the good olden days, we used to just have an ampule taped to the uh, to the IV pole when we were giving people uh, narcotic medications. When that happened, I remember in residence, you just break it open and you push that IV, and it's done. But now, with this Narcan being available as an intranasal. And with some of these potent things, one dose is not enough. You might need uh, three, four uh, repeated doses just to overcome that. And the primary responders need to be aware of it that uh, prolonged exposure, if you're trying to do resuscitation of these people, you could put yourself at risk. So having uh, that awareness might not hurt. Yeah. I don't want to attend it. So we need some additional language. <laughs> So, so no, what you're suggesting is we do put some additional language in the agreement? Yeah. If, if that is okay with the board or um, with the yeah. medical director, just to add on uh, um, having a prescription for Narcan or Naloxone. Just in the middle school and high school? Yes. <laughs> just to add that. I think we can do that and have Dr. Snyder have a prescription. sign it? So I don't know Dr. Snyder Personally, do you well, I, I can talk to him. That, okay. That's okay with you. That, I think Absolutely. I, th I think that would be a wonderful. Does anybody else on the board disagree with that? 
Okay, okay then you have the board's blessing. Of, okay, I'll talk, talk to Dr. Schneider, Schneider and get that the first slide. On that and, uh, give a slide. And make a that in. So then, do we approve with that language tonight, or do we need to bring it no, back? No, I, I think we can approve it. And so then, yeah. with the provision to add that into the agreement uh, to add on an additional medications as maybe seen fit in the future throughout the year. Okay, so you did process. make the motion. So I can we, say that uh, with the provision to add uh, additional medications as may be necessary for the health and well-being of the students. But I'll, I'll I'll second. Second. You did second, you were in agreement? Okay. Very good. Bobby, you got all that? Okay. I think so. Alrighty, cool. Alrighty. Um, once again, since, well, this one is uh, this is on a voluntary basis, so there are no monetary considerations. So, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Alrighty. Uh, on to item H: lunch and milk prices. Motion to approve as presented. Second. Yeah, a uh, motion by Dr. Duke, second from Ms. Newfeld, to approve this. Uh, yeah, discussion. I believe there was some discussion earlier about for the upgrade. Correct. Having it go up and it. That did. Okay. So, are we all uh, good with the numbers as presented? Uh, any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries. The Item I construction house materials bids. There is a plethora. I do uh, make a motion to approve, but I think we still are waiting on the very well. Seven and six cents for kitchen cabinets, bathroom vanities, and countertops. 
problem number 58, 14, 82 cents for waiters and doors, and problem number for 20,628 cents for printing materials. Motion for uh, Dr. Deep, second to Ms. Long. Any discussion? How does this, how does what do we do? Do wait on the drywall until somebody puts well, in a bid? Well, Michael, that was going to be my question. Since the drywall bid is typically below what we require for bidding, can we go ahead and um, no one bid the drywall? And so we're going to send the packets out to the contractors that have bid the school project in the past. And typically that that bid would be somewhere between six and seven thousand dollars to just go to have uh, Jordan be able to go with a low bid for the drywall. Low bid not to exceed some number. What was the bid? In I would say that the number would be ten thousand because if it's over ten thousand, we have to bid it. Oh, I didn't know you were here. Yeah. Uh, so last year, <laughs> you're quite a jerk. Uh, drywall out of Wausau received the bid for $48,000. Approximately, there was some change and stuff in there. Um, I guess what I'm looking at is even if we go with the inflation that all the other contractors kind of had on their bids, um, even if we approximate kind of a guesstimate of $5,800, oh, I think I said $58,000 earlier. Yeah, yeah. $5,800, sorry. Um, I think we'll definitely be in the ballpark um, of where we kind of can expect to be this year. Tim, I don't know if this would be the appropriate time to we have to discuss what we're going to sell the house for. Um, no, we'll put that together. You and I will work on that. Right. And we're going to make sure we cover our costs. Right. Okay. Are there any other questions? I mean, uh, for the last meeting, we did a lot of awesome advertising and stuff. Uh, a lot of good things going on, on Facebook. If you guys want to check that out. Um, Lisa, I've been working with Lisa from the journal about a write-up. Things like that. So it's a matter of interest. Just this morning on my way to work, I was listening to the radio station on Rylander. And they had on there that the Unified School District of Indigo was looking for offers on the construction house. So please contact Jordan Kratz and give them your phone number. That's awesome. I, I, I submitted that uh, probably a month and a half ago, and I never heard anything in return. Heard so this I'm glad you're now running that. You're lucky I was going to work late, otherwise That's I wouldn't cool. have heard it. So, nice job there. So, at some point, we talked about we weren't going to do the construction house unless we had it sold in advance. But not this year. Right? Yeah. Well, I don't know if Andy was there for the discussion when he came to the committee of the whole house. This was an committee of the whole Was it the committee of the whole that we did that? No, maybe it was no, a meeting. It was, was a last meeting, meeting right here. So, yeah. mm -hmm. It was our right last meeting, I think. Yeah. June 26th. Yeah. June 26th? Yeah, that was the one I lost reception in. So, so it wasn't happening this year? No, I think we were looking to, we were going to give them give them one more because, because they were able to sell it. I actually sold both the one from the previous year and last year. Both got yeah. sold and stuff and moved. Well, and Jordan's new in this position. Yep. So it takes a while to acclimate, but we were going to go on a year by year case basis. Okay, thank you. And, and Jordan's completely revamped the um, drawing from the year prior, and um, to his credit, he's done some significant improvements with just the overall roof design, the kitchen layout. Um, it's a pretty nice looking floor plan, and I think um, hopefully we'll get people interested in bidding on it. We're getting going earlier than we have in the past. When the kids were here and you did that presentation that night, didn't we talk about them having actually work at, at a site? Or, or was that when it was pre-sold? Like if it was pre-sold? Remember they talked mm -hmm. about if it wasn't like Well, I, I think that late. that discussion at that time, and Jordan, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the discussion was looking at the different options for the future. Uh, instead of building it here, building it on a, a site already, going, going off the school grounds to build it, uh, possibly looking at a a tiny house or something, or, or some different configurations, just as an effort to keep the program alive. Correct. 
Um, I actually, at the Lake Lake Boating Manufacturers Alliance this previous uh, Friday, I met with Mark from the city, I forget his last name. Dustin Dillon. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, talked with him, and he was very excited to just kind of hear about the program and what I'm trying to do with it. He wants to try and organize something where the vacant lots from the city somehow they're gonna they want to work with us and potentially work with Habitat and try and keep that thing going one way or another. Great. So the city backs the program. That's good. Cool. So the reason that we decided to go with Willem for the windows, even though they are a little higher, was because they are local contractors. Uh, that's a huge plus. But actually, Colby and Colby only bid the windows. They did not supply a bid for any of the doors. So that bid, even though it's a difference of approximately $600 or so. Didn't have the doors. There's no doors in there. I have doors. So, back to back. Yeah, that's what that comes from. Oh, thank you. Thanks for reading those materials. <laughs> So the only thing that we really need to possibly have the motion amended to is to include, to include drywall. the drywall bid not to exceed. Should it go with six thousand dollars? Is that okay? I think that I I really feel that would be enough to cover it. I'd like to stay with the bidding requirements to give us a little latitude. You know, it's nice to get this thing locked up in the next. 30 days, and if we can get somebody to bid on it, um, you know, and I, I think we should, uh, between Jake, myself, and Jordan, figure out what the bid is competitive or not. Or are you going to team this drywall? <laughs> what, what do you want to set it? Uh, 10,000. That's the normal bid. I, I, I just don't want to, you know, we're right now we're asking for. for Quotations for it, and you know, if you if the board wants us to take it back in September, we can. No, that's okay. It'd be nice to let uh, let Jordan work with the contractor and get it nailed down and let's go. And I'm okay with that. Okay. So once again, your motion. Okay. In addition to this, I'll I'll make a, I'll amend my motion to say that we should also uh, include a bid for the drywall not to exceed a dollar amount of ten thousand dollars. Gene, you second the motion? Yeah. You're good with the amended motion. Great. Okay. Any other discussion? Just, just um, uh, do we have a good number of students attending this class? Uh, currently, there's 10 signed up. Yeah. Um, part it? of that, I feel, is I'm taking over the class now, or I'm taking over the prerequisite course, carpentry. So last year, and obviously the year prior to that, before I was even involved, the class was split up between two teachers that did not teach the construction program. Um, I just feel having a pathway now where the kids are going to get to know me in the carpentry, which is a prerequisite, and then they'll get to build the house with me. I think that's only going to strengthen the program. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Love you. Welcome. Mary Newcomb? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Danny Pyatt? Yes. Danielle Yushka? Yes. J.D. Schrader? Yes. Jeannie Long? Yes. Jessica Mead? Yes. Andy Mary? Yes. Noel Deep? Yes. And Mike Golden? Yes. Jordan, go build the house. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and you need and to sell. market it to the students too now. Sell it. Yeah. Last year I had a student that was seriously interested in it. Uh, he was a senior. He, I don't know. It ended up falling through, but he came and took a tour on his own time. He, he was very interested. So, yeah. It'd be interesting to stop in sometime and see your design. The way Tim describes it, it sounds like it's pretty neat. So wonderful. Alrighty. Uh, item J, garbage bins. I'll make a motion to accept the garbage pickup and disposal bid from waste management. Or, I just say the No, I think. 
I'll second it. Yeah. Are there any we have a motion from Ms. Yuska, a second from Ms. Pyatt to accept the bid for, um, for garbage pickup and disposal from waste management. Do you have the numbers in front of you for the next? And that's a three year contract, correct? Right? Okay. Any questions? Other than the fact that it's interesting that the higher bidder goes up each year and the one yeah. who's getting it goes up, down, and a little back up. I can shed light on that. Oh, please do. Uh, Crestwood, Pleasantview, and Spring Valley are dropped off next year and the following year, so that explains that the decrease, the high bidder did not decrease nearly as much. They come from Purple Street. Actually, they went up. <coughs> Already. Waste management. So it was a three year bid, that's why I can't remember doing it before. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, let's do roll call one more time since we're spending money. Uh, Danny Pyatt? Yes. Dan Nadiushka? Yes. JD Schrader? Yes. Jeannie Long? Yes. Jessica Mead? Yes. Andy Mary? Yes. Noel Deep? Yes. Mary Newfeld? Yes. And Mike Folding? Yes. Item K, new hires. Who wants to tackle it? I move the board approve the following new hires. Daniel Cox, 4K, early childhood, $41,000. Jason Lambert, second grade at East, $52,500. Christopher Barry, cross categorical at East, $54,500 plus $2,000. Benjamin Kessler, math teacher at high school, for $44,500. Plus $2,000. Brittany Hammond, English teacher at middle school, $38,000. And Megan Murphy, school psychologist, $63,000. Support staff as follows Deborah Van Oken, library clerk, full time, from $1.93. Melissa Zinzakowski, special ed, IAFD, $13.31. Trisha Majewski, food service, full time, $13.31. Don Liz, Food service full time thirteen dollars and fifty seven cents. Catherine White food service part time ten dollars and thirty seven cents. Tracy Bussey special at IA part time thirteen dollars and thirty one cents. Deborah Raymond food service part time nine dollars and seventy one cents. And Andrea AP and regular ED IA interpreter twenty one dollars. Okay, motion from Dr. Deep, second from Ms. Yuska. Uh, any questions on any of these? What's the plus two thousand dollars on those on the on the bonus the, bonus. Huh? Maybe signing bonus. bonus. Yeah. It is. And what is it? As, like a signing bonus or an incentive. Oh. And my fear is that <laughs> as we get further away or further into Act Ten, you know, this is becoming the norm. So oh, okay. teachers now can negotiate, if you will, between districts. In fact, um, Heidi just locked in a school psychologist who hopefully can be on. Oh, she is on yeah. here. We squeaked her in today. Oh, well, he's good. But it took, I mean, <laughs> Heidi worked with her well over a week on negotiating. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it's the difference between a candidate, you know, signing and not. So, okay. and what, what helps with that incentive then or signing bonuses, it's one-time money, and it doesn't continually accrue on one's salary, so. And we're kind of in the corner, too, where we know, like, you'll see the signing, sign-on bonuses with later for positions that we couldn't fill. Couldn't right. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we don't have much of a choice. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're starting to see it more and more in the business world. I mean, there, I've seen advertisements for one of our local businesses for anywhere from the $2,000 to $5,000 signing bonus mm -hmm. just to get people to work. So it's understandable with the current climate. Mm -hmm. so. can, you, can you clarify, what did you say Andrea could be? Because I couldn't open it. What did you say Andrea could be was hired as? $21. No, but did you, I couldn't know what her position, what you said, it didn't sound right, but. Regular, I, 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 she's an interpreter. Okay, it did say deaf interpreter. Okay, I just. I didn't say DHH. She's a treasure. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get 
do want to. That's good enough. I mean, he, she's there for a deaf. She's there for a deaf student. So I mean, she's hired as a. Well, if you want, if you want to put that in there, I don't have a problem to approve with that. If she just read up what was in there. Um, how many hours? Yeah, she has, no, she's full time. She just doesn't so take I benefits, so her salary. I mean, that's more than an instructor. Instructional she's, assistant, isn't it? I yeah, mean, because she has to have she has a, a degree. In right, design. so that should come out of there and put definite. But is she technically an instructional assistant slash interpreter? I'm not sure how she's coded, um, Tim. In there, we pay her outside of the. I mean, it's not. Yeah. She's I, we, we don't issue her a contract. She's on the. My understanding, she's on an hourly basis, like other support staff. Yeah. Okay. So whatever you say. So it's it's. <laughs> Sounds like it's coded the right way here. So, all right. Yeah, the three uh, support staff that we're hiring full time, or four, including Andrea, are they replacing somebody else that was full time? Which ones were? Can you name um, so, uh, the ones that the are? So the library done? clerk, yes, is replacing um, Art Brown, who was at North, and she was full time. Correct. Um, I, you have to tell them about Melissa. Melissa Jenjepkowski. She is replacing um, Eisen. Jim Eisen. Eisen. Jim Eisen. He retired, and he was an instructional assistant, so she's replacing him full time. Yes. And then who's yeah. Trisha's in food, food service. Food service. Oh. Did, did we, Ms. Corey? I know we got a resignation from someone. I, don't yeah, know, I they know we have an upcoming retirement of a full-time position. Oh, yeah, okay. that lady, Check with, Kathy um, Straw or something. Oh, yeah, she, she uh, yeah, told right. me that. Yeah, she will see that in the resignation. Yeah, yeah. but wasn't she food service? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's okay. probably where we have our So we get the new hires first, then we're going to get next to the resignation slash retirements or whatever, so let me clarify itself in the next couple minutes here. So, any other questions on the new hires? <coughs> Hearing none, uh, let's see, this is a lot of, yeah, let's do roll call. Danielle Yershka? Yes. Janie Schrader? Yes. Janie Long? Yes. Jessica Mead? Yes. Andy Mary? Yes. Noel Deep? Yes. Mary Nuko? Yes. Danny Fayette? Yes. Mike Holding? Yes. Good. Thank you, everyone. Now, on to resignations, and we'll be looking for a motion, please. I move the board accept the resignations as follows. Mark Ziegler, Tech Support Specialist at the Anago High School, effective 831-18. Tabitha Shaw, Grade 6 Language Arts Teacher at AMS, effective immediately. Kathy Straw, Kitchen Cook Assistant at AMS, effective 914-18. Corey Helms, Lunch Assistant at AMS, effective 8318. Craig Furch. Psychologist effective immediately, and Dan Chandler, math teacher at AHS, effective <coughs> immediately as presented. Andy, yeah, do you see that biology thing? Mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. Do we need a second? I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. The motion was by Mr. Mary, second by Mr. Pyatt. There's no discussion. So to answer Jeannie's question, the only one asking for a waiver of the um, financial penalty, right, is Tabitha Shaw. Okay, how much is the penalty now? A thousand? Yep. I think that's and she um, did I mean, amend the decision. Um, no, that may be incorrect. I think it's I think more it's twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred. Because we received that after no, July. It's in the letter that she provided. It said, "I am assessed a financial penalty of thousand dollars for terminating oh, my contract." She got it in before June third, uh, July thirtieth. That's correct. Oh, so it is only a thousand. If it's no. after July third, July thirtieth, it's, it's twenty five hundred. Correct. So even though your talking about it this evening, she did resign effectively right, before that date. And she meant she was going to stay here, but decided she can't be away from family, right? Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. well, she got a baby and a toddler. Yeah, and it sounded well. kind of like he already left, and they tried this Sheboygan Anigo thing, and it didn't work. Yeah. 
because I think they're going to be like one in three or something like that. So, uh -huh. so, with a little. so you have to amend the motion to leave her off if you wanted to impose the penalty, is that correct? Um, or could you just add the language? Yeah, to we the should the probably address that one separately. Um, or you don't think so the, penalty the motion was resignation was just to accept her. Mm -hmm. She has and She presented it asking to so have that uh, waived. Oh, so you're uh, saying you waived it with your motion? Yeah. I took it the other way. <laughs> but I guess you're right. Yeah, because she didn't. She presented it. So she just asked to have it waived. It's not saying we are going to waive it. Right. No, but her letter. As her letter, he's. You're saying, I'm saying I accepted the resignations as presented, and in her resignation, she asked to have it waived. So that would be approved, not charging for the thousand dollar fee. That was over the. Clear. I'll rescind my second to that motion because I think a contract is a contract, and we need to stick with contracts. Or this is going to be a slippery slope in the future. But we've done that in the past. But well, you got to start somewhere. And we're going to have a lot You're withdrawing your second. Okay. Well, okay. go ahead. The, le the letter does state, and I'll just read it right straight from here. And due to these factors, I believe the reasoning behind the early termination of my contract is unique, and therefore it hopes that it will allow you to exercise latitude in regards to whether or not I am assessed a penalty, financial penalty of $1,000 for terminating my contract for the 2018-2019 school year. It's I our guess, latitude. I guess I'll second the motion. Yeah. Mr. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Too. I, you know, I have a problem with trying to collect this because we've already set a precedent of uh, not collecting it. Well, then we shouldn't have it at all. Um, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And I think that precedent was set not with Dr. Tim, but with did we collect a fee from Tina? We did not. Yeah, and I think it, you know, just from a morale issue, if we don't collect it from administrators and then we try to collect it from teachers, I don't see the fairness in that. And I also don't see the fairness in trying to collect a $2,500 um, penalty from a teacher who makes, I assume Tabitha is making about $40,000. Um, which is about six more than 6% of her income. And then from an administrator, we would only collect 2% if we collect it. I understand your point of view, but also those are in there for a reason that if you abolish that, people could just walk up in the last minute. And it also, like Dr. Sprig just mentioned, we had to give two people uh, sign on bonuses, OK? And because it was at the last minute and you're trying to find a qualified candidate to fill that void that was created by someone leaving at the last minute. So I see it as point of view where a contract is a contract. If you hold people to the spirit of the letter as written, then you should not void your contract until and unless you're dying. Or there's something that uh, literally is forcing your hands that you cannot carry on that job responsibility. And if you have a plan in place that your family is moving, then uh, you could have uh, probably thought about doing it at the same time. You could have put in your resignation at the end of the previous school year. So I'm, I'm okay with waiving it, but I think from now onwards, if we have to, pro to present a view to the uh, staff that you know, we do not condone such behavior. So maybe we need to be very careful in how you display your leniency in the situations. Maybe yeah, but maybe we need amount. to be realistic about what this penalty is. I, I mean, I think it's ironic that Tina Verhagen was the one who said, let's have this $2,500 uh, penalty, except for me. And we didn't, yeah. Well, I can think of in very recent history an administrator that left under great duress, and at that time, there was one board member who was very adamant that that individual pay a penalty, and he did. 
So it's yeah. it's not a matter of that we haven't done this in the past. We have. But we've also done it both ways. We haven't done it consistently. And I, I exactly. think, to your point, Noel, we should have something that is consistent, but it ought to be realistic. I agree completely that either, either you have a dollar amount or you have a percentage of their income because you brought up the issue of percentage. So if you feel that it is not fair to have uh, administrator only pay 1% or 2%, then maybe when you drop their contracts in the future, and if you feel that 3% uh, or 5% should be appropriate for everyone, then maybe that's how the board uh, and your HR personnel should drop the contracts in the future. So maybe we should do 2% instead of a flat fee? That's what I'm saying. What did you guys do in Warsaw? There were flat fees um, assessed, and they were, um, now I'm guessing, but m far more often than not, they were imposed. Well, were they like this amount? Mm -hmm. and I, think I think for administrators it was higher, though, um, I want to say three years. And what do those people, um, like, like if it was a teacher in her position, what is what is the average teacher pay at that position versus here? Because, I mean, maybe there should be compensation. I would say it's comparable. You know, we're not, the disparity between the two salary schedules is not so great okay. that okay. that Just flat number is, <clears throat> it's reasonable. Dr. Sprague, I recall that we did a survey of local um, that is your turn. local districts on what they were doing. And um, so our um, liquidated damages is very similar to what our neighbors are doing. Some of them are more, some of them are less. Right. The other thing I would offer Jessica, sometimes, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Jessica, that it is negotiated. So we <laughs> can call it a signing bonus or sometimes people say I would need you, my mm -hmm. incoming district, to pay my liquidated damages at my last. Okay. okay. So that's becoming frequent as well. Yes, so I think Tina discussed that it was, I mean some of it was for the reasoning of trying to find somebody at last minute and, right. but like I, I personally think we should revisit it because I think it's ineffective. I mean do you think that <laughs> Tabitha? was like, this is going to make or break me. I'm sure she's asking because it's nothing she had planned on, and she also mentions, you know, gaps in, co in compensation. But I don't find it effective. We, we're looking at this, like, all the time, and people are going to leave regardless, and then they get sign-on bonuses. And that's what I'm saying. If, if there is a case of life and death or some major family situation or something that prompts you to leave at the last minute, breaking your contract, those are situations that you could probably look at and say, you know, if somebody is leaving because their parent or loved one is uh, terminally ill or something that they want to take care of them, do you want to impose this penalty on them in that situation? You're already dealing with a devastating situation. But if you have somebody who, you know, you wait until almost the beginning of the school year, knowing fully well that this is a possibility, you entertain it and you spring it on us at the last minute, which causes undue anguish to the board and you know you're you're entering into a school year where your students may not have that mm -hmm. teacher that you, you also don't want that situation to develop where people could think that the board is always leaning and they'll let me go. Heidi then Cliff, go. Um, I was just gonna say this happened to me in Rhinelander and think about it this way because um, I left in October five years ago and they assessed me my liquidated damages and I tried to get out of it as anybody would and they said no you're gonna pay it um, and then they tried to accrue actual damages. And if you think, like, because they had to go and find somebody, liquidated damages are so you don't go for actual. So it's not about is it effective or not. It is about the district's responsibility then to cover the costs of subs and trying to find somebody. So it's, you got to kind of think of it that way. And I, I looked into the law because I'm like, you can't do both. You can do one or you can do the other. You can, you can say $2,500 for my liquidated damages, or you can try to assess me actual cost, but you can't do both. And I was right. So I'm just trying to get you to think about it. It's not about a penalty on them. It's about to make up for what the district is losing. Clint, your turn. You uh, had your hand up. I agree with Dr. Deep and Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> 
They, wait, they made my point. Wait, oh, okay. so Good. your point is enforced? Well, well the, you know, and it, and it happened at, at the high school most recently in, with one of our teachers in the math department, and it, it is a struggle very much, very to find close quality close candidates. And it, I, I am in favor of uh, assessing those damages because I, I think that we need to we need to try to recoup something with that. And it, it is about what, what the district is losing because we put money into those people. Mm -hmm. I could. Let, me, let me make a suggestion to the board here in this instance. As far as the motion goes, it's at this point, it's to accept the resignation. There is a possibility, I believe, that we could enter a second motion that would cover the monetary penalty portion of this, and we can complete that after the original motion. Does that sound feasible to the board? Yes. So, so okay. Basically, basically we're, with the motion as it is currently structured, we're just saying that we agree to accept the resignations. Subsequent to that, there would be a second motion that would come up about waiving the monetary penalty okay. specifically for Mrs. Shaw. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to recognize that out or? or no, we are, we are only no. going to vote on accepting the resignations. That will not include mm -hmm. the request to waive the The request the penalty would be because a separate motion. Right. Okay. That's then not you're going to draw more attention to it. If, if, we, if we let it fly, if then, we if we do it according, then we're then, then you can exclude that one candidate and vote on the others, and then vote on that particular candidate with that provision. If that's okay with the board, yeah, it accomplishes the same purpose. Oh. Right. Either either way, that person will be singled out. Right. Or you can single out each person too. And and let me remind you that when we were doing some of the hires <coughs> last month, that we did single out one individual because of a conflict that one of the board members had with that one. And so that person was singled out as well. So this is this is not new territory, folks. I was just saying, if we, do we want to draw attention to it if we're approving, if we're going to let her not have to pay the $1,000? So be it if we do. Okay. You know, we're all adults here. We've got to figure it out at some point. So. Any further discussion on the resignations? We do have a motion for Mr. Mary. Mr. Plant withdrew his second, but we did receive a second from Mr. Schrader. So we have motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. You now we would be any, looking for a second motion. We didn't ask for any abstentions. What? We didn't ask for any abstentions. Mm -hmm. Anybody abstain? You're voting for. You're voting no, for to accept all. To accept all, all resignations. <coughs> okay. Now we would be looking for a separate motion in regards to waiving the monetary penalty for Mrs. Shaw. What if you only charged her a thousand eighty? Would that feel like an acceptable compromise to you? That, that's all. That's all. Oh, that's I thought it was twenty five hundred. You're no, right. No, sorry, 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 sorry. Mm. You did, and I forgot. Yeah. Okay, we're okay. looking for a motion, please. I'll make a motion right. to whatever we're doing, except <laughs> waiving the monetary penalty that is what you're for the contract for either to It's shop. either to waive it or to not accept the waiver. Or to reduce it. Or, what are you making? I can't do it then because there's way too much talk and I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> I motion. thought we were I thought we were voting to waive her penalty. Okay. Or you so could you also do it. Don't vote. talk because this is if, my if, very if first you time I've done this. Motion, <laughs> if you're making the motion to waive the penalty, that will be your motion. Isn't that what we said? Well, there's not your head if you guys think that's right. That's no, what, okay. okay that, your motion I is that motion to waive the penalty for Tabitha Shaw. I'll second it. Okay. The monetary penalty, yes. Now, the motion on the floor then is to waive the monetary penalty. So in other words, we're going to say we're, she does not have to pay it. Uh -huh. All right. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Aye. No. No. Okay. Let, no, we're going to do 
do this then. We're going to do it. Bobby, let's do roll call. This is to approve the motion to waive the penalty. If you vote aye, you're in favor of it. If you vote <coughs> no, you're and against it. Mm -hmm. Keep the penalty. Schrader. I'm going to abstain for the moment. Jeannie Long. No. Just come in. No. Andy Mary. Yes. Noel Deep. No. Mary Newcalt. Yes. Danny Pyatt. No. Danielle Yushka. Yes. Mike Bolding. No. What was the what's the total? <laughs> <laughs> you can you vote yes or no? You can, you can, you can I just abstain? Absolutely. Yeah. I really don't know the answer. Yeah. I'm doing that. If you want to abstain, you can abstain. I'll abstain. Okay. In that case, the motion carries, or the motion is defeated five to three right. with one abstention, so the penalty, monetary penalty, will stay. Yeah. Okay. There. Yes. <laughs> Mike, would this be a good time to ask Tim or Melanie, Dr. Sprague, to come up with some type of plan that we don't have to... I think that is a point that will be good for discussion for, the committee, for, of the whole for the committee of the whole and a topic that we could put on one of our upcoming agendas so that we come up with a plan that we can stick with. That's right. That's Mr. Grant's first project. <laughs> Alrighty. And uh, the last item in board action tonight will be donations. So we'll be looking for a motion, please. I move the board accept the following donations. 1,000 from Tim and Rose Prunty for the Nabokin School Forest. 1,000 from Dan and Diane Kretz for the Nabokin School Forest. $200 from the Angels Belt Lodge, number 662 for Fill a Backpack. 25,000 from an anonymous vote donor for the Nabokin School Forest. $250 from CoVantage for Fill a Backpack. $125 from the St. Joseph's Holy Family Council for fill a backpack. $200 from Johnson Coyle for fill a backpack. Totaling donations of $27,775. Second by Mr. Grant. Second. Second by Mr. Payette. On the anonymous donation, that was in the um, honor of Gordian Gloria Schofield. Oh, so somebody yeah. put it in their name. Mm -hmm. How nice. That's cool. You can add that to the list. Thank you. I think yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Tim, for bringing that up. It's nice. Alrighty. How did the fill a backpack go? Good turnout? It's oh, over. Backpacks? The fill a backpack? Mm -hmm. over 430, 440. We have still about a dozen in the middle school office with names on them. A couple of moms just picked them up today that they had set aside. So definitely. I mean, good turnout. That's great. Community support for that has always mm -hmm. been good. It's wonderful to see this kind of community support as well. So, uh, we have a motion on the floor to accept the donations. I'll second. Oh, we have a second. Oh, we have a second. Yep, Ms. Reed and Mr. Pyatt took care of the busy work. We just have one other thing to say. All those in favor of accepting the donations, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. We thank our generous community for yeah. their unselfishness. And Mr. Prunty, as I told you earlier, I'm very nice that you and uh, your other fellow in the whole thing, folks, you know what you're doing. Hey, so, is Tim, is this St. Joseph's at What is St. Joseph's? I should have asked him the discussion. Motion from Mr. Pryor to adjourn okay. second from Ms. Mead. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, we are adjourned.